Hey everybody, this is Alex Voss, your professor at TV eCourse, and this is our class on radar. Radar stands for radio detection and ranging. It was around starting in the late 1930s and in the 1940s. Basically, if we take a microwave frequency of radio and we, we send it out in a beam, it, it strikes a, something that reflected like an airplane, then that reflected signal will bounce back to the radar receiver. Now, because it travels at the speed of light, that is radio waves, then we can determine by the delay how far away that plane is, by how long it takes for the signal to reach it and reflect back. And that's the basis on, of how radar works. And of course, you'd use different frequencies of, of microwave energy to detect planes, jets, ships, um, if you want to look at clouds, you can also use that to show you how, if there's clouds off in the distance or whatever. And so radio detection and ranging has been around and it's a, me a method of determining distant objects and determining their position. This is a great uh, series of U.S. Air Force films on radar. And it also covers a lot of basic transmitting and receiving principles of microwave devices. So take a good look at this film and learn all you can. Sure appreciate you. Many different radar sets, each built to do one certain job better than anything else. However, regardless of size, design, or job, all pulsed radar sets operate on the same basic principles. And the component parts of all these sets are essentially the same. And whichever set you work on, your job, the repairman's job, is the same. To keep your set working and working right all the time. That goes for every set, from the latest searchlight set, the ANTPL, to this early settler, the SCR-268, on alert in the theater of operations. This one's in Italy. But what's about to happen to it can happen anywhere, on any set, and often does. The operator is on target. Whoa there, wait a minute, what goes on here? Now that's better. Hey! That does it. Well, what is it? Set trouble? Jamming? Mice in the local oscillator? Whatever it is, it's got to be fixed in nothing flat. Bombers won't wait. And it's your job. It's you radar repairmen who will be handed the problem and the nothing flat to do it in. So you have to know your stuff. You have to know if it's set trouble or not. And if it is, locate it and fix it. In the first film of this series, we reduced all radar sets into a simplified block diagram. You saw how the timer originates the pulses, the transmitter converts them into RF energy, and the antenna flings them into space. At the same time, remember, the timer sends part of each energy pulse to the indicator, where it starts the sweep of the baseline. The main pip at the beginning of the baseline is formed when part of the energy leaving the transmitter is picked up by the sensitive receiver. The baseline is synchronized with the outgoing pulse and provides us with an accurate electronic yardstick for measuring the distance traveled by each pulse. When a target comes within range, echo signals are reflected. These signals are picked up by the receiving antenna, amplified by the receiver, and finally register on the baseline of the indicator as a target pip. The position of the target pip on the baseline is calibrated by the set, and in that way you find the range of the target. Each set transmits high-frequency radio energy in the form of short pulses, followed by a listening period, one long enough to permit a target echo to return from maximum range. In that way, echo signals can be seen clearly by themselves. To make sure that the proper time intervals are maintained, and that at these intervals, each unit is triggered off to a time accuracy of one millionth of a second, 
Every set is equipped with a master timepiece, called a timer, or sometimes synchronizer or keyer. Here's what the timer of a typical long-range early warning set, the SCR-271D, looks like. And here's its heart, the vacuum tube in the timing oscillator. All the tubes won't look like this, but they all do the same job. Here's what it is. First, it generates a sine wave, where each cycle is identical with all the others. If the sine wave's frequency is a thousand cycles a second, we have actually divided one second into a thousand equal parts. But in this sine wave, it's impossible to tell where each thousandth of a second begins and ends. That's why it's changed into this, a peaked wave, which can be measured from positive peak to positive peak. This wave is the basic controlling wave of the set. All the component actions of our radar are synchronized with these peaks. For instance, it's part of this peaked wave voltage that passes from the timer to the indicator to trigger off the baseline. This synchronizes the baseline with the outgoing pulse because at the same time, the same peaked wave triggers a pulse forming circuit, which creates a new waveform, pulses with flat tops. Notice that throughout these changes, the exact subdivisions of our second in time have not been lost. We still have precisely the same number of positive peaks per second that our original sine wave did. But here is the important difference. In the original sine wave, the voltage rises and falls gradually. The action is easy, never sudden. When we use the rectangular trigger pulse, the voltage rises from zero to its peak value instantly, remains at that point for the length of the pulse duration, then immediately returns to zero. Pulse duration is also called pulse width. This action of the trigger pulse causes sudden powerful bursts of energy to be generated and transmitted. Then with equal suddenness, the energy is turned off while the outbound pulse travels through space. This transmission of radio energy may last from half a microsecond to several microseconds, then goes off for several thousand microseconds. On again, off again. So many pulses per second. Some sets transmit wider pulses than others. These are frequently the early warning sets, which pick up targets as far away as 150 miles. The echoes from the long-range target register on the baseline as a distinct pip, but as the target comes closer to the set, the echo pip on the baseline approaches and may even merge with the main bang and be lost. The long-range sets don't worry about this. They turn the target over to short-range sets. But to track short-range targets effectively, we must keep the target pip from merging with the main bang. That's why short-range sets must transmit narrow pulses or pulses of short duration. With this type of pulse, the set will get a distinct and separate echo pip on the baseline, even at extremely short ranges. We can conclude, therefore, that the width of the pulse largely determines the effective minimum range of the set. Now let's examine the time interval between these pulses. This time interval, or listening period, must cover the time it takes for an outgoing pulse to reach a target at maximum range and return. For a set designed to operate at a maximum range of 20 miles, the timer might generate as many as 4,500 pulses per second. But if the desired maximum range is 100 miles, the listening period has to be longer. And the timer might have time to generate no more than 900 pulses per second. You can see then that one of the basic factors in determining the maximum range of the set is this fixed rate of pulse repetition. It's known as the pulse recurrence frequency or P-R-F.
Pips indicate all kinds of things. An enemy task force maneuvering through fog or darkness. Our own reconnaissance planes. The splash from a coast artillery shell. The answer to an IFF challenge. Or perhaps this is the signal returned from an enemy rocket ship or guided missile. The electronic eye of radar detects and locates these targets. But for this information to be of any value to you, we need different types of oscilloscopes to present this data visually, accurately, and effectively. Some scopes measure range only. Others measure either azimuth or elevation. Some present data on both range and azimuth at the same time. And still others measure both azimuth and elevation. Now you'll see how these scope presentations are formed and how the scopes display the data they obtain. In the first film of this series, we reduced all radar sets into this simplified block diagram. You saw how the timer generates a voltage pulse and sends it along to the transmitter. At the same time, it sends part of each pulse to the indicator where it starts forming a baseline. Back at the transmitter, the pulse is converted into high frequency energy sent to the transmitting antenna and launched into space. However, a spillover of this energy escapes into the receiving antenna and goes down to the indicator where it appears on the baseline as the main bang. The sweep of the baseline is synchronized with the outgoing pulse so it can measure the time it takes a pulse to leave the transmitter, reach a target, and its echo return. When the outgoing pulse strikes a target and part of the energy is reflected back to the radar set as an echo, the receiving antenna's job is to pick up the returning echo and shoot it along to the sensitive receiver. Here, the weak echo is amplified and sent as a voltage pulse to the indicator so it can appear as a target pip. Basically, that's how all radars work. And in the first two pictures of this series, you saw in detail how the timer, transmitter, and receiver did their jobs. In this film, we'll see how the indicator functions. Let's take a look behind the panel and see how this typical A presentation is formed. This scope picture, as well as all others, are created by a special type of vacuum tube called a cathode ray tube. There are two basic types of cathode ray tubes, the electrostatic and the electromagnetic. These tubes produce all the scope pictures in radar. Let's see how they operate. First, to review what we know of the electrostatic tube. At the rear end of the tube is an electron gun, composed of a heater, cathode, grid, and focusing anodes. The cathode, when heated, gives off electrons, which are formed into a stream by the grid. The anodes accelerate the electrons and focus them into a beam. The beam bombards the fluorescent coating on the face of the tube and causes it to glow with a bright spot of light. These plates deflect the beam horizontally. When positive and negative voltage is applied alternately to the plates in the form of a sine wave, the beam is swung back and forth like this. But when sawtooth voltage is applied, it causes the beam to sweep across and snap back quickly. At normal speed, we get this picture, or an apparent baseline. The pips are formed by the action of the vertical deflecting plates, which bend the beam up and down each time a signal pulse is received. Thus you can see that the electron beam is affected by both the horizontal and vertical deflecting plates. This is the usual type of A-scope. But these two sets of plates, by working together, can form any number of different scope pictures. For example, by changing the polarity of the voltage on the vertical plates, you end up with an A-scope on which the pips appear as negative deflections like this SCR-582. These scopes on which the target appears as a single pip are okay for early warning and range data, but they were not designed to give elevation and azimuth data. This is why. A pulse traveling through space follows a path closely resembling that of a searchlight beam, and the greatest intensity of the beam 
lies in a direct line through the center. The strength of the beam diminishes gradually to either side of center until it reaches a point of minimum strength at the edges. The pattern is called a lobe, which is nothing more than an imaginary plot drawn to indicate the intensity variations of the radar beam. Let's say we have a target in the center of the beam, where the intensity is greatest. The target will reflect a strong echo, and you'll get a good-sized pip on the scope. But if the target moves ahead of the beam to a point where the intensity is weaker, the echo will also be weaker, resulting in a pip that's barely visible. As you traverse the antenna to catch up with the target, the plane is in a stronger part of the beam, and you get a stronger pip. It's the same on the other side of the beam. Minimum intensity, small pip. Maximum intensity, full pip. Always letting you know when your beam is pointed directly at the target. But here's why a single pip can't provide accurate azimuth or elevation data. When the target signal on your scope fades, did the plane move ahead of the beam, behind it, above it, below it, or is the signal just fading due to a faulty set? You have no way of knowing. And if you assume the plane's getting away from you and begin searching for it, there's a 50-50 chance you'll traverse in the wrong direction and lose the target completely. To remedy the weakness of the single lobing system, we switch this single lobe back and forth so fast that you have virtually two identical lobes. When you have a target, these lobes are represented on the scope by two separate pips, one for the right lobe and one for the left. When the target is centered between the two lobes, the pips balance. That is, they're the same height. But if the target gets off-center, naturally it's going to be in a stronger part of one lobe and a weaker part of the other. Here, for instance, the targets move to the left, so the left pip gets bigger, the right one smaller. If the target moves to the right, the right pip gets larger. To center the target, all you have to do is traverse the antenna toward the larger pip until the two pips are again balanced. Then you know the target is centered in your beam and you're exactly on target. Keep the pips balanced and you'll stay on target. 